Hello and welcome to Math Mini Lessons. My name is Sarah Fuentes and I'm your personal math coach. That is the way that I usually start our videos for middle schoolers and um, um, elementary school students here at Math Mini Lessons. We create videos and lessons for students, for families, for schools, because we truly believe that anyone can be a math marvel. So this video came out because we had a high schooler who said, can you please do high school math for us here on YouTube? So to prep us for the New York State Regents and because I'm from New York, I was like, absolutely. I can absolutely do that for you because again, I'm from the Bronx, I made it happen. So I'm happy to see other kids from New York want to do their best. And if you clicked onto this video, this says so much about who you are as a person. It means that you're someone who's taking the time to grow and develop and be better than wherever you are, that you are someone who knows that they can grow in this process. And that is an amazing thing because again, math should be accessible for everyone, but not everyone believes that. Not everyone believes they have that capability and that power and they are so scared of doing math that it allows them to just stop and give up. But if you're watching this video, and this is a long video, then this says again that that is not who you are. That even though you may have challenges, it's not going to stop you in this process. So I'm going to give you three things about today's video that's going to be helpful. Here's the first one. The goal in this video is to be accessible in the mathematics, meaning I'm going to try my very best to break down the concepts and the strategies in a way that makes sense to anybody, um, especially our high schoolers who are about to take this exam. So that's the first goal. Some of the strategies will sound just like what you do in school. Some may sound a little bit different and that's okay. Which leads me to my second point. Um, this is not the end or be all only way of doing math. Guess what? There are lots of different strategies to this. So um, there might be other ways that you have for solving that you've seen. And because this is a community, this is the place where you get to share that with the rest of us. So if you have another way, another strategy, or you want one explained a little bit more thoroughly, please just add it into the comments and say, Sarah, can you please make a video about this? Um, or I'm really curious about what you were doing in number seven. Can you make more problems like that? And we're happy to do that. And that leads to the third one. How do you actually use this video? Well, this video is going to definitely be over an hour. I think it's at an hour and 10 minutes. I don't expect anyone to watch this like a movie all one hour, 10 minutes. So the goal is you should, if you haven't done so yet, hit pause and actually get a copy of the June 22 Regents. And if you go to our page, you can find the link um, and you can get your own copy of the PDF and actually do the problems yourself. So that's the best way, just do it and see where you are. This is not, no one's gonna come to knock on your door and say anything about you. The only judgment you will hear is from your own head. That's it. So just see where you are. You're, if case, just see what you have to work on, what you're already really strong at, and then come back to this video. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go over all the answers together. I'm gonna just show them to you, hit pause, jot them down. Prioritize, do the ones that you didn't get right first so you can skip around the video. Um, and anything that you found challenging, even if you got it right, those are the second ones you should prioritize. Okay, so that's it. I hope that makes it really helpful. Welcome to this community. You are a math marvel just by clicking onto this. So with that, let's get started on the Algebra 1 Regents Review. Okay, math marbles, we're going to jump in and start actually reviewing the Algebra 1 Regents. And this is the June 2022. You can use the links in the last video on our page to actually find a copy of this exam. So let's start actually breaking down what the answers are and what this information will give us. And this is just going to be for part one. Part one is only multiple choice. There are 24 questions and there are two points each. So that means at most you could get 48 out of the 86 points right here on part one, just a multiple choice. And if you were to get 28 points, this would get you a level three, which is enough to just pass the regions. Now, remember, we're not just trying to pass the regions. We really want to try our best and excel and get to that level four, level five. I will say that again, remember to get a level four, we need 52 points. In other words, even if you completely ace the multiple choice, you still need to get at least four points in the constructive response to get to a level four. It is not possible to get to a level four without 
doing um, without getting some constructive response and getting a combination of these points. And over here, you have all the different types of questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you as we go through the different problems, you can actually see, I have it well listed in red, what kind of topic it actually is from the exam itself. Okay. And I'm also going to tell you a percentage at the bottom um, of every single question or actually at the top of the question. So for example, if you see that there's a topic and it says 46%, that means in all of New York city, that is the average number of students who got it correct. So 46% of students were proficient on that question. And this is really helpful, right? Because if you have a question that's 80%, that means most students were able to get it right. It was, that tells you something about the problem. But if you see a problem that's maybe, let's say 23%, then you know this was probably, a, this was a really challenging problem um, and the level of rigor or there's something about that topic that just challenged more people. So it's just helpful for you to know. And that's why I want to give you that information so you can see what line you are. Are you part of 46% that got it right? Or are you part of the 54% that really struggled with that problem? So you're going to get all that information. So first thing I need you to do is I need you to go and get your, get your actual test paper. I'm going to show you the answers right now. You're going to be able to hit pause and actually check over your answers for just the multiple choice. So go and get that. And here you are, Math Marbles. Let me make it a little bigger. Here it is. Here's all the points for the June 2022 Algebra 1 Regents. Hit pause and you can jot it down. The answers are right here where it says scoring key. And if you get it correct, then you get the two points. If it is incorrect, then you get zero points. There are no half Cs on this exam. Okay, so we're gonna unpause it. Now this is my advice to you. As you're going through, I hope you've identified or marked which questions you had incorrect. And those are the ones that definitely just making sure that you go and review. So for example, if these are ones that I had errors in, then I would make sure I watched those questions to figure out what was the same, what was similar in our thinking, what was different. And I'm going to be really transparent, meaning um, sharing some context with you. I'm going to show you some strategies that may be different or maybe similar to what you're seeing in school. And they are by no means the only way to solve these problems. So I'm just giving you another vantage point. I'm trying to break it down um, in a way that I hope makes sense to most people, but as I can absolutely tell you there are other ways to solve these problems, but my goal is to just ensure for you that you can actually see that these are the answers and I'm showing you how my thinking derived at those answers. Okay. So let's get ready to jump in and get started. Again, you can play the video through if you want to see all the strategies and get another vantage point, or you can just fast forward to the actual problems that you need. I'm going to go page by page the same way we do in the regions. Okay, let's start off here is page two, the first five problems. And you can see here in red, these are the question types. And this is the percentage of students in New York who are proficient at that question. And this, since it's the first page, remember tests typically ramp up. So you can see all of these have 67% or higher, pretty, pretty high rates of proficiency for the first page. And the more you go on, the more rigorous the exam probably is. So we're going to start with the first one, uh, which correlation shows a casual relationship. So what I'm looking for when I'm thinking about correlation, I'm looking for some type of proportional relationships, just some type of relationship where one thing impacts another. Um, and I'm also looking for this versus what I call, um, well, that's just a coincidence. So it could be like that sometimes happens, but they're not really related. It has no impact on the other thing. It's, it's just a coincidence. So let's look at this first one over here. The first one we're connecting the more minutes an athlete is on the field versus the more goals. Um, well, sometimes that's true, but not always. If you're the more you play, the more likely you are. So there is some probability in there, but that is not always true in terms of minutes. You can play a whole game and not get any points. So it's not only about the minutes. Um, let's look at the second one. The more gasoline you purchase, 
the more you pay. Well, yeah, the more gasoline you purchase, the more you pay. That That is directly. This one's always true. The more you purchase, the more you're going to pay because they're both connected to a payment part. Uh, number three, the longer a shopper stays. So this is about time. The more purchases. Again, not always true. And the third one, the price per gift. The price increases, the size increase. Not always true. What if I buy a piece of jewelry? Jewelry is very small. So, and that can cost a lot. And that's a very small box. Okay, so number one, we get the answer to. Um, we're gonna look at the number two part, which statement is always true. Um, and this one, the answer is also two and the way i'm looking at this is you're going to just substitute the value where it says f of x you're going to substitute that value for x into that expression to see if the rest of the equation is true so for example in the first one is three times zero minus five equal to zero uh okay let's so this is zero minus five is equal to zero no we know that that's not true but in the second one three times three minus five is equal to four. Yep, well, nine minus five is equal to four. So that would be true. So that's all you have to do in that one. And just you can see in the other ones, if you had four, three times four minus five equals three. 12 minus five is not equal to three. And in the last one, three times five minus five is equal to zero. Uh, no, 15 minus five, again, is not equal to zero. So that's all you have to do for, for that one. Let me draw a little bit of a line here just so you can see the difference. All right, let's look at the next one. At Benny's Cafe, a mixed green salad costs five seventy-five. Additional toppings can be added for 75 cents, which function could be used to determine the cost in dollars of a salad with S additional toppings. All right, so the important part is we know the cost of the salad, the total cost, and we know the toppings can be added for 75 cents each. We want to determine the cost part. So my cost, C of S, is going to be based on um, what the salad costs, which is 575, that's a constant, plus however many toppings I get. So whatever 0.75 um, times however many toppings. So if I get one topping, S is equal to one. So that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so that's the salad, plus this is the variable part, which is the number of toppings, and that will determine another cost. So I'm just looking to see which one matches that, and I will get to. So why can't the other ones be true? Um, and the first one here, because this is not fixed, the cost of the salad um, doesn't change. We don't, it doesn't change with each topping. Each topping is 75%, so that's where that error is. Um, in the second part here, all the person did it would be, if they separated the five and the 75, that doesn't make sense because we know the salad is 575, that's a constant, and each topping is added to that. And you could just see they did the reverse on the second one. Okay. All right. For this next part, we're going to actually factor out this problem. Um, meaning I want to get it into one of these settings where is where I have this times this, um, two binomials in there, uh, because I have X squared, I already know that X is going to be on the first ones. And now I'm going to use the factors of negative six. I'm going to take, that last term over here and the first thing i'm gonna do i'm, I'm gonna find the factors of negative six and i'm gonna see if i were to add them together would i get this number here the b value to positive five all right so i'm going to put the factors for negative six i get negative six times one um or i can do its opposite six times one. Um, and at the same time, I could also have negative two times three, uh, or is opposite two and negative three. Okay, and now I'm just gonna try and add them up together just to see what would happen if we were to add them up together. Negative six plus one gives me negative five. 
six plus negative one, that gives me positive five. Uh, negative two plus three, that gives me just one. And two plus a negative three, that would be a negative one. So there you have it. You can actually see the one that we want is right here. Positive six and a negative one. So I'm just gonna put positive six and a negative one. And that would give us four. And if you wanna check your work, you can use foil to do that. Um, I actually, foil, mm, I sometimes like to, I would rather use an array model just to triple check my work. So just so you can kind of see what that looks like. I'm really into visuals. So here's X and here's positive six and here's X and here's negative one. So X times X, that's X squared. X times negative one, that's negative one X. Um, six times X is six X and six times negative one is negative six. So automatically the only two, I'm, I have my X squared, um, six X minus one X is five X and I'm left with negative six. So those are all my, my like terms. If you're not sure how I actually did that, I'm going to put all those terms here at the bottom. So I have X squared negative one X, positive six X and negative six. And I'm just going to combine like terms with these two. Okay. So when you combine those like terms, negative one X plus six X, you get five X. So that's how I simplified it out and you get X squared plus five X minus six. All right. And there you go. And you could also see why um, they actually are using all these other factors, the two and the three, they're all, they're here as well, two and three. And they also had the, the other two in there. So they had the right factors. It's just you being able to actually pick the correct ones that give you that middle term. All right, and let's look at number five on this one. Peter has $100 to spend at his party. So it's already, you can tell it's about an equation. Um, he has $100 to spend both Bottle, uh, bottles of lemonade are two dollars and juice is 50 cents so this is actually gonna be an inequality because you you know if you only have a hundred dollars in your pocket you can't spend more than that so here's your hundred dollars you can not spend more than that you can spend exactly that so i'm going to use that symbol there and there's my hundred dollars uh so do we know how much juice and how much lemonade no but we know the lemonade is going to be y so that's going to be two y's because they're two dollars each plus um the juice bottles are going to be 50 cents and that's going to be your x Oops, I made a mistake. X is the lemonade, Y is the juice. So let me fix that, my mistake. Um, so two X, cause that's the lemonade and Y are the juice bottles. So plus 0.50 Y, glad I checked that part. All right, so that's all I'm gonna look for. Two X plus 50 Y is less than or equal to a hundred dollars. And I can see it where do we actually see it? 2x plus 50y, I can see it over here in three. Okay, um, most kids would probably pick this one by accident. This is the most likely accident to actually happen because we have the right variables or the right terms, um, but they just a reverse symbol. Another, I could also see someone just doing the same mistake I initially made, like I did this one first where I had the two Y together. And it just means I, it's not the math, I just didn't read carefully enough. All right, hit pause, jot this one down, make sure you have an understanding of this page. We're gonna go to page three in a sec. All right, here we go, page three, we have six, seven, and eight. Once again, all of these have a 60% proficiency or higher, and still, um, we're gonna be able to do all of these without a calculator, just like the first page. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Let's start with the first one with a domain problem. Which domain is most appropriate for the function? Um, for a function that represents the number of items, 
placed into a laundry basket each day. So, all right, let's do some context. What kind of things are you putting into a laundry basket? You're putting clothes into a laundry basket. So if you're putting, if X represents those items that you're placing, which ones of these make sense? Um, the only one I can't have one because I can't have negative clothes. Like, can you imagine you have negative three socks that that would not make sense because we're talking about clothing. Okay. Same thing with a rational number. Can you have 2.3 pair of items in your basket? No, um, we definitely can't have an irrational item in there the only one that makes sense would be whole numbers like I, if you were to talk about the, the number of items you would only use whole numbers to describe them let's look at the second one what is the solution to three halves b plus five is less than 17. all right so we're just going to put this in we're gonna solve this the same way we would any type of equation. Um, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a zero pair. I want to make a zero pair here using subtraction. I want that zero pair, so I'm left with only three halves B is less than, on the other side, 17 minus five is just 12, okay? And now I wanna um, isolate that B. I just want the B by itself, one B. So I'm gonna divide by the coefficient. This way, I'm left with just B on this side. And I'm going to just put this here on this side just so, actually, I know a lot of people would write it this way at first. So I'm gonna rewrite that as a complex fraction so I can have 12 is divided by 3 halves. And you can you could actually solve it this way straight away, but most of us use the conventional um, by rewriting this as a multiplication problem. So keep most people would keep this first one, multiply by the reciprocal, and you get twenty four thirds, which is the same as b is less than eight, which would be right there. Perfect. Um, the, the other part I was saying before is I could actually just solve it this way. 12 divided by 3 is 4, and 1 divided by 2, that would be um, a half. So you could actually solve that, and you would still get 8. Um, not important. I can just solve it this way. We get B is less than 8. All right, let's go into the next part. Which one represents an exponential relationship? So this is what I'm gonna have you do. You're gonna look for um, constant change in this one and we want exponential versus linear. And when it's linear, we know that it's a constant rate. So let's look at the differences happening here on our chart. My X's are changing by ones. And in all of these, this is true. You can see it, these are all going by ones. but we're gonna look at the function on the other side. So on this end over here, um, it's going plus three, plus three. I'm looking at the difference, plus three, plus three. So this one has a constant difference of three. So this is linear. Because my, my rate of change is constant. Um, let's look at the second one too here. This one is also increasing by fives. So this is also linear, has a constant difference. Um, but when we look at three, if I look at it, it's it looks like the first one is increasing by 12, and then the second one from 16 to 64. Wow, it's not incre this is not constant, so it's not an addition one. This is actually a multiplication difference. This one is increasing by four. This makes it exponential, right? Because I can represent this as four to the x power, okay? So for example, when this is one, when x is one, four to the first power, it's just gonna give me four. Four to the second power gives me 16. 
64 to the third power gives me 64 and so on. And you can see in the next one, these are also increasing by 2.5. What's tricky in this one is that you actually have um, negatives. Actually, it's they're decreasing. So, decreasing by 2.5. Okay, because we have negative numbers there. So, this is still linear um, because it's still uh, just decreasing by a constant rate. The only one that has a different one is the one that has the exponent in there. Okay. All right. Let's look at the last one on this page and it's just a power power rule. So I'm um, that kind of looks like this. When you have an exponent next to a coefficient and that's not that nice little parentheses, all you're going to do, you're going to multiply these two together and you get X to whatever the product is of a and b so in this case we have five to the x times three we know that this is means my base is going to stay the same five and i'm going to multiply those two at the top um and i'm going to get six x so this question is actually asking which one is not equivalent to this so which one would not be equivalent to five times um, six to the six X power? So I'm just going to use that over here in each one of these. So my base is five, six times X is six X. My base is five, three X times two is still six X. My base is five, five times X is five X. So there you go. Not equal to the same and um, five to the second power times three X base is five. 2 times 3 is 6x. There you go. All right, so you can hit pause, jot this down, make sure you have all of these different reasonings. And again, you can also put into the chat if you have different questions or thoughts about any of these or share different strategies. I love hearing about these. All right, here's page four. You can look at what we're noticing here in terms of proficiency. Notice that uh, the highest one is number 10 with 60%. And now we're getting a little lower into the 40s and the 50s. So that's just, again, as you progress on the exam, you get a little bit more complicated. So let's start with the first one with 10. What are we looking for? Uh, which of these is a function? So we're gonna look for repeated X values. So um, I think a lot about the vertical line test for this. So if I were to, let's say this is a graph and I have a point, well, I'm going to just draw like a line over here. I would want to make sure I would make sure that there's only one X value for each of these. Every single point that's here on this line, there's only one X happening. But let's say I had something like this. I'm going to just randomly draw, let's see, what if I had these two points over here and here? So let's say it was like this. This would fail my vertical line test because I have two X values. So let's say this is three, just making this easy, three and negative three. This one, it would be three positive three, and this would be three negative three. Here I have X repeated and I have two different Y values. And that's why it would fail the vertical line test. So as I'm looking through our choices up here, um, in the first one too, notice that you have two uh, repeated X values. I have a one and a one and I have different Y values. So that's why this would be a fail. Number two actually would pass our vertical line test. Anywhere I would draw lines, I would still only have one touch point. So this would pass the vertical line test. And so that, sorry, that's for choice three. Um, in this part over here with two, I'm looking at a piecewise function. And what I want you to also notice is again, we have some repetition here. So let's say if this was a function, um, so let's say if it was f of two on the first part it would be it would equal to two. And the second one f of two, but in this case, it would be two squared. So I would get different, different answers there. So that's why this will be a fail. 
And so again, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for those repeated X values. And on this one down here, let's make it just a little bit bigger so you can see it. Check and see, scan, do you see repeated X values? Yes, right here. So again, repeated X values and different Y values. So this would also be a fail. All right. Okay, now let's go to the next one, number 11, and this one's 52%, so we're getting a little lower here. The formula AX plus BY equals C represents the equation of the line, which expression represents Y in terms of A, B, C, and X. Okay, so we're gonna do some, uh, some algebra for, for this one, and the most common mistake I'm gonna tell you right now is usually just these really small algebraic mistakes as people are solving equations. So I'm gonna start by just writing our equation down. Oop, AX plus B is equal to C. And all I really want, I want to, which represents Y in terms of, so I wanna make it Y equals. That's my goal, okay, I, that's what I want. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna create I want to get rid of this AX, so I'm going to subtract on both sides, and that's going to leave me to B times Y is equal to C minus AX. And then whatever that coefficient B is, let's say if that was a 4, if it was 4Y, you know you would just divide by 4. Part is that we're seeing a BY, so in this case we're just going to divide by B. We're going to do the same thing the other side, B. And that's going to leave us with Y is equal to C minus AX over B. And there you have it. All right, so again, the only thing that's tricky is it's the same algebra. It's just that we just see a lot more letters. And sometimes that could be a little bit confusing for us. Let's go to number 12, and 12 has the lowest proficiency so far, up to 40%. Uh, we wanna know what are the zeros in, for f of x is equal to 2x minus four and 3x plus four. All right, so all we're gonna do is I'm gonna take both of these here, 2x minus four, and I'm gonna set it to zero. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the other one. 3x plus 4 is equal to 0. And we're going to solve it out just using our algebra. So 2x is equal to 4 divided by 2. Divide by 2x is equal to 2. And I'm going to do the same thing with the other side. Again, all I'm doing is I want to know what the zeros are, so I'm setting that binomial to 0. So let's subtract by 4. 3x is equal to minus 4, divide by 3. x is equal to negative 4 thirds. So the zeros are 2 and negative 4 thirds. There you go. I can see them right there. All right, and let's look at the third one. It's just creating an equation. Uh, Joe has dimes and nickels, and it's piggy bank totaling 145. So that's important to know. Dimes and nickels equal dollar 45 which number of nickels the number of nickels he has is five more than twice the number of dimes which equation could it be so notice a lot of times not even looking at multiple choice i'm solving this out okay so the first thing we know um i know that if i were to add my dimes and my nickels i get a dollar 45 so i'm gonna put 0.1 dimes plus 0 0.05 for nickels would give me a dollar forty-five. Why am I not just writing dimes plus nickels? Um, because if I have five dimes, let's say this is five and this is ten, that would not give me a dollar forty-five. I would know that each dime is equal to ten cents, so I would have to multiply those two together. That's why I have to put that those coefficients in there. All right, but we also know that the second part we have five more than twice the number of dimes. All right, so twice the number of dimes is 2d plus 5 would give me the number of nickels. So I'm just going to substitute that. I, if I know this, I'm going to take this part here 
And I'm gonna, since this is equal to n, I'm just gonna take this and substitute it for n. That's all I'm gonna do. So now I have 0.1d plus 0 0.5 times 2d plus five is equal to $1.45. Now I only have one variable to work with. That makes it so much easier. So, and what you can see is, so I could use this equation. I could use this to find out, to solve the rest, to find out the number of dimes. And there it is. That's all they did. They took that first part of the equation and they used substitution to find the second one. All right, so hit pause so you can jot down any of these notes for questions 10, 11, 12, and 13. All right, let's look at our fifth page over here. We have now numbers you see they're starting to dip in terms of proficiency level, especially with number 14. And it's probably because of um, one of the parts of the problem I'm gonna get into in a second. I'm also gonna use a calculator. That's why you see this little box on the, on the side for part of number 14. All right, so let's look at the first one. 14 has to do with data. And so I want to know which statement it would be correct, meaning I have to look at all these different choices to prove or disprove it. The first one has to do with mean and the second one has to do with median. Um, the thirds have to do with quartile ranges, which means box of whiskers. And I'm going to, and that's what I think is happening here. People don't remember how to make a box of whisker plot. So I'm actually going to show you how to do that. But let's start with the first part, uh, which one Andrew has a higher mean. So let's test it. I'm going to add up Andrew's numbers. All right, 78, 96, 87, 94, and 93. So take the sum, divide by five. So Andrew's mean is 89.6. And this statement says it's larger than Donna's. All right, I'm going to do the same thing. I divide it by five. Donna's is 91.6. So that is not a true statement. We're going to invalidate it. I get to cross it out. Second part has to do with medians. All right, so first of all, I'm going to close this up. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. because I want to give us a lot of space and room. Um, I can use medians for this next whole part. I'm going to start with, um, actually, I'm just going to do Donna first. Don and Andrew have the same median. So let's put Donna's numbers in order from least to greatest. So here's, it goes from 87, 90, 92, 94, and 95. So her median would be 92. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this as Donna's. And let's do the same thing for Andrew. Andrew's goes from 78, 87, 93, 94, and 96. So his is 93. So again, this is not true, not a true statement. So two is wrong. They do not have the same median. Um, three and four have to do with making a box and whisker plot. So if you don't remember how to do this, here's what you're gonna do. All you do is you start by making your whiskers at your minimum and maximum. Luckily, we have the numbers already in order, so this is gonna work out perfectly. So our whiskers go from the smallest numbers. So I'm looking at Donna's first, from 87 to 95. And I'm gonna draw a line to these numbers, okay? Now the median is gonna be the middle of my box. And I'm gonna change this color for a second. And then my quartiles are between the medians and my extremities. So here we go, we have a box and a whisker plot. What you probably do not remember is how to name these. So starting from the minimum, this would be zero. Then I have Q1, my median is Q2, Q3, and Q4, okay? I'm gonna do the same thing with Andrew so you could also see it because we're gonna need it for these next two. 
The minimum is 78, my maximum is 96. I'm gonna draw a straight line, both of them. My median, my 93, that's my Q2. Whatever is between my minimum and my median, that's Q1. What's between my middle and the other side, the other end, that's my Q3. And usually you have more numbers in this, so this works out really, really well. Okay, so here's zero, here's Q1, here's Q2, here's Q3, and here's Q4. So again, my theory is most kids didn't remember how to do a box and whisker plot in ninth grade. They just didn't get to it, and so that's where they got tripped up, and that's why this is so low at 37%. All right, number three, it says Andrew has a higher quartile, inner quartile range than Donna. The inner quartile range means the difference between Q1 and Q3. What's this range of numbers from Q1 to Q3? So most people just do Q3 minus Q1. That's what most people do. They just take whatever Q3 is, they subtract Q1, and that gives you your interquartile range, okay? So Andrew has 94 in Q3. So here's Andrew's. 94 minus 87, that's his Q1, and that gives us seven. Donna, her Q3 is also 94, and her Q1 is 90, so her IQ, uh, inner quartile range is just four. Okay, so does Andrew have a larger range than Donna? Yes. And the third, the fourth one was the third quartile for Donna is greater than the third quartile for Andrew. Nope, that is not true because the third quartile, 94, can 94 be greater than 94? No, they have the same third quartile. All right, so that's it for, for that one. You just have to learn how to draw it. All right, this ended up being really super easy only because we had five numbers, five easy numbers. A lot of times this is a lot harder when we have more numbers than that. But my guess is most people didn't remember how to just draw a box and whisker plot, and that's what screwed up a lot of students. That's why it was only that number. All right, let's get to number 15. Ooh, this is where it starts to get fun. We're talking sequences. So what do we know? The first term in the sequence is 5. The fifth term is 17. What is the common difference? All right, so I'm just going to just, just think about this for a second. We have five numbers. We know the first one is five, and we know the fifth term is 17. They're all going by the same thing. It's a sequence, right? We want to know what the common difference is. So this is my, my thinking on this one, because I, I have a lot of fun with these. Um, I kept thinking, well, what's the big difference between 15 and 17 and once I know that number which we know it's it's 12 and now I want to know like what if I were to split that up between these four jumps that would make my common difference three okay and you can test that out by oh and I'm going to put a plus three there just so because it's positive three so look at the sequence five plus three is eight 8 plus 3 is 11, 11 plus 3 is 14, and 14 plus 3 is 17. Boom, mic drop, done. That's all it was. All right, let's look at number 16. And this one I had a lot of fun with too, because I, I love playing just a visual game. I like thinking outside the box with these. A quadratic function and a linear function. So we have quadratics, linear, they're on the same graph. Which one could not be possible all right so i want to see situations could any of these not be possible so the first one the graphs do not intersect so kind of imagine this is it possible for me to have this and this happen yeah that can happen on a graph so i'm gonna disprove that one I want to write it in black. That's possible. I can have graphs. Um, I can have them do this, but I could also have them. Is it possible for them to never intersect? Is that possible? Yeah, that can happen too. I can have a graph 
And what if I had, let's say this here, and maybe my line is a lot lower. Like, so my parabola is pretty high up um, and I can have a straight line on the bottom and they never intersect. That could absolutely happen. That can happen in a part. Uh, could I have a, a situation where they intersect one time? Yes. Um, we just saw that. There could be a place where, let's say I have a line, maybe it just touches at one point. So that could happen where it only intersects at one place. Could it intersect in two places? Yeah. I can have a line, a straight line, and now it's intersected in two places. So that can happen. Can it intersect three times? No. So this is the only one where I can't create a place where it goes through three points. Um, there's a place where nothing happens. There's a place where it can happen, like maybe at just the end, um, that that little part there, I can have a place where it touches two times, but because of the nature of this quadratic, there's no way for it to intersect three times because this is a straight line. So that can't happen. All right, and let's go to the next one. Um, I have m minus 3 to the second power, which, which one is equivalent. So I'm going to take this m minus 3 to the second power. I'm going to rewrite that as m minus 3 times m minus 3. And you could use FOIL. Okay, so my first numbers, m times m would be m squared. Um, my outers would be m times negative three, so I would just be negative three m. My inners, so first numbers, outer numbers, inners, negative three times m would still be negative three m. And then my last numbers should be negative three times negative three, which would be nine. And then I'm just gonna combine like terms meaning these two over here, I'm going to add them up together and I get negative 6m. Okay, so I get m squared minus 6m plus 9. So where do you see it? Right over here. So again, notice um, this was a trick I used to do. It's not even a trick. It's a convention, a practice I used when I was younger. I don't even look at the multiple choice until I do my work. My work confirms my thoughts. And then I look for choices, the multiple choice that that connect that are aligned to my thinking and my work. There are only some cases where I have to look at the multiple choice, like the data one where I had to pick which one is true. So I had to look at all of them to find the valid one. But in most cases, I do my work and then I choose something that matches my work. I hate guessing and I will tell you that great test makers will pick put answers in there that look like the correct answer. And for example, looking here, I know there are some kids who are just going to go, oh, well, m squared and negative 3 squared is just 9, so m squared plus 9 and just pick one. So many kids do that because they're just looking and they their brain just goes super fast and they just see this and just go without slowing themselves down. So slow down your thinking and actually do the work, make sure it's visual on the page. That is going to really help you not make a lot of the smaller errors. Just do the work. Don't, don't keep it all in your head, just actually slow yourself down and do the work on the page and make your thinking visible. And then look for what matches. So this was using foil. Um, I do also, again, have a lot of kids in middle school who prefer using the, the array model. I, I also really like it a lot. I wish I had learned it. Let me make this a little bigger. I wish I had learned things like this when I was younger. I think I would have been a lot more excited about math if I had. And you can again put m, m minus three and m, m minus three. And literally you're just multiplying those two numbers. So m times m is m squared. Three, negative three times m is negative three m. 3 times m is negative 3 m, and negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. And then kids can again, you can just write it out. Here are all your terms, and then combine these like terms.
this was easier for me to do than trying to remember what all the letters of foil meant like my brain was doing so much all the time trying to move these things around and going well this to this and then this to this and that confused me so me personally i like the array model but if foil works for you do what works best for you when you're thinking okay so i'm gonna hit pause again and hear your answers for 14 through 17. Okay, we're gonna look at 18, 19. I am gonna use a graphing calculator for these. Um, so I'm going to rearrange my screen just for a little bit. With this first one, Ms. Russo asked her students to explain why three fourths is the solution to this equation. And here are the three reasons. Andrea said you can graph the equations on a graphing calculator and the point can be found in the table. Um, Bill says that you can substitute and it, it would make the equation true. And Christine said you can graph it and the points would be on the line. All right, so I'm gonna again use Desmos to help us out with this so we can actually see these in action. I'm gonna type in, let's put in the equation, 2y plus 3x equals one. Um, and I'm also gonna put in our point three, negative four. There we go. Just so we can label a point and let's close it in there so we can see it in there. All right, so first things first, um, I don't ex have this, um, the table up right now, but if I, I actually did, we would actually see this, it would be a point on the table because it is a solution. Like I just graphed it on the calculator and I can see the point right here, here's three, four. So it would be on the table on my calculator, so Andrea would be correct. Uh, for Bill, Bill would do it by substitution. So he would put um, 2, negative 4 plus 3, 3 equals 1. And you would get negative 8 plus 9 is equal to positive 1. And that is also true. And Christine would just graph it. And again, you can see the point literally right here when you graph it. So this means all three of them would be correct. Okay. Um, let's look at this bottom one. Four quadratic functions are shown. Two of them are, are equations. Um, and we have one table. I'm going to erase this for a second. Uh, we have a table and we have one graph. And we want to know which of these statements is true. Okay, well, the first one, the maximum of f of x is less. So f of x means I'm talking about this one here, is less than the maximum 4j. Okay, so just looking at my points over here, um, I could actually say this is my maximum five. Why? Because I could see that after it gets, it goes up from negative four, it goes up to five and it goes back down again. So here's my maximum. For f of x. All right, let's look for the maximum in for, for j, for j of x. So I'm going to just graph it on my calculator. Negative, um, I wanna make sure I have, I'm gonna put 0.5. Here we go, sorry about that. Negative point, point, y is equal to negative 0.5 x squared plus x plus 4. All right, so I've graphed it just so I can see it, and I can see that here's my maximum. Uh, it would be 1 and 4.5, so here... My maximum is equal to 4.5. And again, I'm still getting used to doing a lot of this on my iPad. It's a little different when I'm typing in um, and using the pencil. So apologies that it takes a little bit longer. But all right, so is this true? Is 5 less than 4.5? No, 5 is not less than 4.5. So not true. Okay, the maximum for g of x is less than h of x. So I'm going to do the same thing. Um, with h of x, we could actually see what it is. 
Our maximum would be one, two, three, four. So I'm gonna do the same equation over here. I'm just gonna do y is equal to negative parentheses x minus four back. My iPad's acting a little funny today, but that's okay. Squared plus five. All right, so let's just close this out so we can see it. Here's my maximum. Um, that point is four, five, so my maximum is equal to five. Okay, so g of x, five, is less than h of x, which was four. Also, not true. Five is not less than four. All right, maximum of, and now luckily I can see all my stuff here. So max of f of x is equal to max of g of x. So is five equal to five? Yes, that one is true. And the last one, just so I could make sure, triple check, um, max of h of x, which is four, is equal to j of x, which is 4.5. And that is also false. So not true, not true, not true, not true. Okay, so there we go, we have three. So again, hit pause, jot this down. Notice how, again, I'm just using my resources. I'm using my graphing calculator on my iPad. You have a very, you have a graphing calculator during the exam. So if you're not sure of what the maximum is for your quadratic, graph it. Graph it and identify that point. And we just use our Y values for that. And here we are, we're at page seven, which is the last set of our problems from 20 to 24. Look and see, this is our last page. And notice some of our questions go into the 20s for proficiencies. So less than half of students were able to get these problems right. So some of this is endurance, some of this is just the complexity of the problems. All right, so we're gonna start with the first one. And an example of a six degree polynomial with a leading coefficient of seven and a constant term of four. All right, so six degree polynomial. Um, as soon as we said that, I'm thinking that's all I, I need to know about six degree. It means my exponent has a six. Um, and it says it has a leading coefficient of seven. Okay, so that means um, my leading coefficient has a seven somewhere. So seven x, um, x to the sixth power and a constant term of four. So somewhere I have a plus four. So that's all I'm really looking for. And look to see where you, where you identify those. So looking at the first one, um, I do not have, as I'm searching through this first one, this one, I don't have a six degree polynomial, but you can see a kid might say, well, there's a six in front. So no, that's a kid who's confused their leading coefficient with their polynomial. Um, go down to the second one, I'm scanning. I do see four, so that's what I want. I definitely want a four in there. So this is looking good so far. Um, and here we go, I see it. Here's my leading coefficient seven and my six degree polynomial, x to the six. I see it there. They just haven't written it in standard form. So normally we'd, we'd see this at, in the front. We would see seven X to the six first and then minus three X squared plus X plus four. They've just moved all the terms around. So conventionally we'd write it in, in that way, in that sequence, but that's not the way they've written it. And again, that, that's what makes it tricky for, for some people. We're really smart for that. All right, um, and just looking at the other ones, why do the next ones not work? Again, here I don't have a leading, um, a six degree polynomial, so nope, can't work. And in the next one, I also don't have four as a constant term, so it doesn't work for either one. All right, let's look at the next one. I actually kind of enjoyed this one too because it reminded me of something with seventh grade math. 
In the equation, A equals P times one plus R, rates to time, A is total amount, P is principal, R is the annual interest rate, T is time, which statement correctly relates the information regarding the annual interest rate for each given equation. Love this because you will need to use this so often in life when you start talking about annual interest rates for things like um, major purchases. So let's look at, at the first one. For A is equal to P times 1.025 T, the principal amount of money is increasing at a rate of 25%. So would that be true? So if I had a rate of 25%, again, that middle has to be one plus that rate. So in this first one, the rate is 25%. So I'm going to change that into a decimal that's just 0.25. So my middle should be 1.25. That's not what we got here. We have 1.025. Boom. Get rid of that. Look at the second one. Um, the principal amount of money is increasing at a rate of 52%. So for number two, again, my rate is 52%. Change that to a decimal um, by moving that decimal to the left, to the left. 1, 2, it would be 0.52. So 1 plus 0.52 would be 1.52. And that's not what we see here. We have 1.0052. So nope. You're kind of getting what I'm doing right now, right? You're kind of seeing it. I'm just doing 1 plus that rate, but that rate must be a decimal. That means I got to change it to that. All right, here's the next one. Um, the principal amount of money is decreasing at a rate of 14%. So you're kind of getting this, right? So it's decreasing. So that means I'm going to subtract 14%. So think about this. My rate is equal um, to 14%. That's the same thing as 0.14. So I'm going to do 1 minus 0.14. And that gives me 0.86. And that's what we got. So three works. And just for the sake of it, let's look at the next one. We got another one decreasing at a rate of 68%. So for number four, it's decreasing rate is 68% or 0.68. So you're doing one. So if this helps, I think it helps. I think it would have helped here too if I had written it that way. So think of it like a dollar minus 68 cents. And that would have given you 32 cents. So 0.32. And again, that's not what we have here. We have 0.68. Okay. So that's all I was doing, Math Marvels, with all of these. It I was just using the statement 1 plus or minus that rate. And for the first two, it was easy because it was just 1 plus the rate. And the second one, it was decreasing, so I had to subtract the rates. Okay. All right, let's look at units, converting units. So I, I, I really like these two. Tim, it takes Tim 4.5 hours to run 50 kilometer, kilometers, which expression will allow him to change the rate to minutes per mile? So I want minutes to miles that's that's my goal i want this to happen so i'm going to look to see where can where do those divide out all right so i'm going to look at the first one and i'm going to go to the first one kind of slow for you so you can see it and what i'm looking for is i'm looking for the same rate at the top and bottom so that they can when you divide a number by itself it gets one they cancel out so in this first one i'm going to do this slowly for you I see hours here and here. So hours divided by hours would cancel out. Okay? Because an hour divided by an hour just leaves one. Do you see anything else on the numerator and denominator that are the same? Yes. I see a kilometer and I see a kilometer. So these would also cancel out. So what this would leave me with is minutes, which is right here, over miles. 
that is why this one is the correct answer. They're not asking me to solve it. They just want to know which expression would allow me to change it to minutes and miles. And the only other math you would do, if they wanted you to solve it, then you would just multiply 2.5 times 1.609 times 60, and that will give you the number of minutes over 50. 50 times 1 times 1. That's if they wanted you to actually solve it out. Let's look at the other ones so you can see if they also cancel. So with number two, again, you're looking. Look to see, do you have any terms that are, any units that are the same numerator denominator? denominator? Um, I see kilometers and kilometers. But I also see over here, hours and hours, they're both denominators, so they do not cancel out. So this is telling me my answer is going to be minutes, miles times minutes and times hours squared and that's what i'm going to end up with here miles time minutes over hours squared so that doesn't work in number three kilometers cancel out and hours cancel out but here i'm left with miles over minutes which is the inverse of what i want i want minutes over miles and the last one, and what can we cancel out? We can cancel out hours and hours, and that's it. So again, I end up with miles times minutes over kilometers squared. Okay, we have two more to go. We have this wonderful equation over here. And we want to solve for x in terms of a to find the solution. So first thing noticing, uh, the most challenging part, each of these have a fractional part at the bottom. So what I'm going to do is I want to eliminate this by multiplying by a large enough number. If I were to multiply it by 4, so again, if I have a 4, I know that these are going to cancel out and these are going to cancel out. And at least if I have a 4 here, I know that at least this will cancel out and I'll have 2. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply all this by 4. So I'm going to end up with 4x minus one over two minus four a over four and four times three a over four and just like in the last one i know that i'm going to use this red for a second this is going to cancel this is going to cancel and this is going to cancel and just leave a two okay uh, because 4 divided by 2 is just going to leave 2. So now I have 2 times x minus 1 minus a is equal to 3a. I like this. I like this a lot. Um, this makes this is a lot simpler. Um, some students may decide to actually distribute here. You can. You can absolutely um, do some distribution here. And you would end up with 2x minus 2 minus a is equal to 3a. Now we can do some solving. We're going to add a to both sides. And we get 2x minus 2 is equal to 4a. Um, again, now this is a simpler one. I want to create a zero pair. So I'm going to add 2 to both sides. And now I have 2x is equal to 4a plus 2. And now I'm going to divide by 2. And that's going to be x. And 4a divided by 2 is 2a. And 2 divided by 2 is 1. So I'm looking for x is equal to 2a plus 1. Do you see 2a plus 1? Yep, right here. 2a plus 1. Um, and that was actually the hardest one. So this was 29%. What tripped up most students was making this more um, easier, it's more friendly to work with. And that was, I had to take care of that, those denominators. I wanted to just change those terms so that they were much more friendly for me to work with. And multiplying was a way to do that. All right, and let's look at the very, very last one. If a sequence is defined is defined recursively as a to one is equal to negative three and a to the n is equal to negative three, um, negative three a n minus one minus two, then a to fourth is equal to. So my goal for this is here's a to one, 
here's the rest. I want to figure out a to the fourth. So I want to make a table. So let's do that. And in my table, I'm going to cut it in half, cut it here, cut it here. All right, I'm going to have one, two, three, and four. We already know what a to the one is. It's negative three. Um, we're gonna go through the rest to figure out what the next ones would actually be. Um, so let's say to find out what a to the fourth would be. Is equal to three a to fourth minus one minus two. All right, so let's go through it. And let's find what, what a to the second would be first. And that would be the same as negative three times what a to the first would be, which is negative three, minus two. So that would be negative three times negative three is nine. Nine minus two would be seven. Okay, and then I wanna get to a to the three. So I would do the same thing, negative three times the number before it, which is seven, minus two. So negative three times seven is negative 21. Negative 21 minus two would give us negative 23. See how my table's kind of helping me out here? Um, and I have to, I can just fill it out and make it keep going. So if I want a to fourth, it would be negative three times the number before in the sequence, which would be negative 23 minus two. Negative three times negative 23 is positive 69. Neg uh, 69 minus two is 67. And there you have it. All right, so that the key to this, this part over here, when I'm looking at this part here, I'm just looking for the number before it. So if I wanna know a to the two, I have to do, a, um, all I'm doing is a to the two minus one, which means I want a to the one, three times a to the one, which is the number right before it. And that's all I did to figure this out, math marbles. Okay, so that's it for this last one. Um, we have now all 24 problems. Each one was worth two points. So use this to figure out how you can work through any of the problems here. Hope this was really, really helpful. Take some time, take a break. Hopefully it took about 90 minutes or less for you to do. And then we're gonna work on the constructive responses in our next video. If you had any questions or if you wanted to share any other ways of solving these problems, just add them to the comments. I love adding them. It really helps out the rest of the community. And it also helps me to figure out, am I being clear? Because that's my goal is to be clear and make sure this math makes sense to you. My job is not to sound so smart that it's not accessible to other kids. Instead, I wanna make sure I'm giving you accurate information in a way that feels accessible um, and helps you make sense of problems. All right, so that's it, Math Marbles. I will see you in the next video, which we will start with question 25, our first two-point problem, and go to the end of this exam. That's it for now, Math Marbles. Be well.